And that's the beauty of practice ownership because you're in the driver's seat, yeah. right? Um, and you you can intentionally make those decisions and and uh, and and drive what the rest of your life would look yeah. like. Yeah. And the cool thing is that asking questions and learning more, it doesn't need to be scary. I mean, uh, it's going to be okay. We're going to figure things out. We're going to make good decisions. And if we're not liking the way the decisions feeling, we can change our minds. That is Dr. Bree Montana and Dr. Lance Rosa veterinarians, practice owners, and so much more. And this is the Vin Foundation's Veterinary Pulse podcast. And we're kicking off the Future's So Bright series on the ins and outs of selling a veterinary practice. I'm Jordan Benchia, Vin Foundation's Executive Director. Join me and our co-host and Vin Foundation board member, Dr. Matt Holland, as we talk with veterinary colleagues about critical topics and share stories. Stories that connect us as humans, as animals, as a veterinary community. This podcast is made possible by individuals like you who donate to the VIN Foundation. Thank you. Please check the episode notes for bios, links, and information mentioned. Welcome back, Bri and Lance. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, happy to be here. Nice to see you as well, Lance. So Bri and Lance have both been guests on the podcast before for our listeners who have listened to other episodes. Um, and as with all things with the Vivian Foundation, our ideas for our resources and our programs, everything comes out of a need that we hear from veterinary colleagues. And today we're kicking off a new podcast series called Practice Transitions. And this has come from a need that we're hearing from veterinary colleagues who are at a time in their career when they're potentially thinking about selling. And what does, and looking to understand what that means. Um, is it corporate selling? Is it selling to an associate? And the ins and outs of all of this and how do they even go about doing it? Um, so we so we're, we brought in some experts, Dr. Bree Montana, who you know runs our Vets for Vets confidential support group. She is also actually a practice owner. And so her and I are going to be tag teaming this series as we talk with different experts. And the expert that we have today is Dr. Lance Rosa. And so he's going to be joining us and shedding some light on his expertise as a veterinarian, as an attorney. Um, he has a lot of practice um, buying and selling experience as well, and also the leader of Drip Vet. So I'm going to start by handing this over. So Bree, will you share a bit about your thought process in wanting to start this series? Absolutely. Um, so over the years, we've been uh, our Vets for Vets program has been active and working with our colleagues for over 10 years. And over that time period, I'll occasionally get a, a, a colleague who's uh, trying to transition from being a practice owner to being in partial retirement or full retirement. Um, and you know, typically we, we, we talk about uh, selling corporate, selling privately, getting an associate uh, to perhaps buy a part of the practice. And I just really didn't pay as much attention to it as I have in the last year when some uh, life changes happened for me. And I started to realize, hey, I'm 61. I have to have a transition plan. I love practicing medicine, but I'd like to practice differently going into the future. So I started listening more to our colleagues and paying more attention to the pulse of folks that were making that transition. And we have colleagues that are transitioning to, um, to a partial practicing. There, Some folks are selling corporate. Lance is going to handle a lot of that part of the conversation for us. Um, what I wanted was to get some expertise. So basically, I'm the guinea pig for, um, for this whole process. I'm realizing, hey, there are a lot of us that are in the, part of, uh, in, in the area of their uh, career where they're ready to step down a little bit, yet maybe they want to um, practice part-time, maybe they want to get out of it entirely. And so this is going to be an awesome resource for all of us who are looking at that possible transition and, and planning next year, five years into the future. We want to get our ducks in order so that we can uh, make a transition as smooth as possible, including all the financial and business aspects of it, as well as some of the personal aspects of it. What do you do with your free time? Obviously, for me, I play with my Huskies, but you know, <laughs> we want to kind of the Huskies always come into play. <laughs> the Huskies and the horses. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I want this um, 
um, series to encompass all of the things that we need to know. And I want it to be a wonderful resource for all of us, uh, not just for the business stuff, but also for the spiritual stuff. How are we going to make that transition and uh, and really make it a joyful transition? So, um, so that's what I'm bringing Great. And we, you know, as always, everything that you guys are going to hear in these series, in these podcasts are going to be put in the episode notes. So we're going to make sure that this can be an interactive conversation, not a one-way discussion. So we will give you links of places that you can share comments, emails that you can reach out to so that we can make sure that we are including subjects and topics that are important to you as well, our listeners. So with that being said, Lance, you know, will you help our audience understand what sort of position they might find themselves in if they're considering selling a practice. What, what do you hear from colleagues about those who are beginning to inch toward that position in their career? Got it. Well, the, the first thing that I'll say, and really goes back to what Bree's comment said, that she kind of found herself in this position where she's starting to look at a transition at a different place in her life. Uh, she mentioned, mentioned some uh, some personal issues that uh, that that kind of started to drive this thought process, and I'll first by start by saying this: you're not alone. There is a there are a ton of veterinarians uh, that are in a very similar position, and it just comes from a function of uh, a, a large group of people got into practice ownership at one point in time, and now those those folks are now entering. Um, you know, the time in their career, their life where it's time to start retiring, and it's not a veterinary only. Uh, issue here. So we're actually facing one of the the largest wealth transfers, the decades of the largest wealth transfers in the history of the, the world, essentially. So there are a lot of baby boomers. There's a lot of folks that are nearing retirement uh, right now. Now, you couple that, you know, just the sheer age and the in the in the types of people that own practices currently, um, and you couple that with the influx of uh, of corporate or private equity dollars into the profession, um, it is driving single, I mean, without a doubt, um, the largest transfer of, of veterinary practices, um, you know, period. Um, so that is the time that we're living in right now. That's the, that is the status of the, the veterinary profession. So, um, you know, there are many people that are in positions just like, just like Bree. Now, so when I do talk to someone, uh, like Bree, another veterinarian that's, that's thinking of selling, I'll actually turn that question on its ear, Jordan, and, and say, you know, if they say they call and they say, I'm ready to sell my practice. Well, the first, my first response to that, that question is another question. Why? Right. And so right. I think the, <laughs> Good the, question. <laughs> first, the first question we have to have to stop and understand is, is why are, why are you in a position where you want to sell your practice? What are the driving factors behind that? Um, and are we selling the practice for the right reasons? Um, and so number one would be, you know, is, is a sell, a, an actual transition, a transaction, the right thing for you? Um, and, and it wasn't mentioned earlier, I am a practice owner. I've owned um, quite a few practices over my career. I've bought and sold practices personally as well, and help, as, well as helping other veterinarians buy and sell practices. Um, and I've definitely been in a position before where um, I come home from work one night or I come home from a hard week or hard month and say, I've got to sell that practice. <laughs> I want out of here so bad. <laughs> and so, um, and so it, it, is this a short term um, uh, issue? Is this a, is this a short term uh, uh, fix or is this a long term planning goal um, that we want to sell the practice? Is there something that's happening in your personal life that it's time to sell health? Uh, spouse's health, et cetera? Or um, is it, hey, this is just really convenient for me to sell right now and I just don't want to be a practice owner anymore? Once we drive in, dig in as to what what the answer of that why is, is it, you know, do you want to invest in something else? Do you want to move move somewhere else with your life? Do you want to move geographically? Um, or is, is practice ownership just not what you want to do? Is it time to move into full retirement? Once we dig into the why, then we can start talking about what options are out there for you. Um, and, and next, once we answer that why, the next step would be, okay, you have decided to sell the practice. What are your options when it ultimately does come to sell the practice. So the way that that why question was answered really drives where where we need to go with the actual transi transaction of the practice. Um, now, once we get there, there are a number of options. Um, and I think the, the, the option that really pops into everyone's mind, you know, first and foremost, is just a complete 100% sell. Um, and, you know, I sell the practice and I'm out of there, um, you know, moving on my way. And that sell can really happen you know, to an associate, a group of associates, 
or a let's call it a corporate, a group practice, uh, you know, some somebody that's backed by private equity. And that's really your, you know, your two large places where you can sell a practice outright 100 percent. But I'll say that there are many other options out there besides just selling your practice to your to an associate, to an outside buyer or to that corporate buyer. Um, there are a number of partnership options. There's ways to bring in associates into minority equity positions. And honestly, there's also the the ability to to manage the practice as an absentee owner. Um, and so bring in a group of associates, um, you know, uh, you know, talk to them about equity or an ownership position down the road, but manage that practice, you know, as an absentee, all of these are easier said than done. Um, but they, they can be done and they have been done very successfully by many other veterinarians. I want to share that when I first started thinking about uh, selling my practice, um, I reached out to Lance and we had a conversation which really changed the way I wanted to go forward. And it really uh, opened up some uh, opportunities and thoughts that I just didn't even consider. I thought, you know, either sell my practice uh, through, uh, a, a, you know, a sales uh place like Simmons and Associates or something like that, that you guys um, all know about. I considered either that or selling to a corporation. And um, really my concern was that I wanted to keep the personality of my practice. I really, I love my practice. I've had it for 20 years and I, you know, we change and grow every year and we, we really want that um, the way it affects my community to stay the same. I want to, I want to continue to provide this great care for my community. And my fear was that if I sold to a corporation, I would lose all of of that personality and um, all of that um, impact on my practice. And so it just kind of opened up my thought. And I think that our this series is going to allow us to have all kinds of different ways of looking at selling our practices. Uh, it's going to open up all kinds of doors for us. And I want, um, I want to share the experience that I had uh, in talking to Lance um, with all of us. And so I think that's going to be super valuable for us going forward. I think we're also going to be pulling in some folks to help us understand what the heck is an EBITDA. I mean, <laughs> honestly, why, why we have to do, we have to use that word for it. It's so complicated and I don't even understand it. Um, so we're going to have some, some folks come in and <laughs> I'm serious. It's so scary. How can I have such a successful practice and not know what I have? Um, and I think that a lot of us might, or I, hopefully I'm not the only person that's that dumb, put it that way. Um, so uh, I think that we're going to be able to look at a lot of different ways of solving the same problem, uh, a lot of different ways of transitioning. Yeah, Bree, there's a there's a lot of new words, a lot of new vocabulary. Um, uh, basically, just definitions are, are what a lot, uh, there's a lot of confusing points and and I'll just I'll just go ahead and say it that I do think that some of these become very, especially on the corporate side, the corporate sales side, unnecessarily complex. Um, and so that's it, we're we're going to be talking about things that are much more than just negotiating price. Um, these are very complex transactions, very complex deals, um, and they really became complex when. Uh, let's just go ahead and say it: private equity lawyers came into the picture, came into the the veterinary profession. Yeah, that's going to be an, another wrinkle that I'm hoping that we'll be able to address. Uh, one of the things that happened when I was looking at selling is I had an offer from a corporate consult, well, someone, a corporation who uh, assured me they're not a corporate consolidator, but I'm pretty sure they were. Um, and the the letter of interest or letter of intent that they offered um, was really interesting, interesting to me. Um, at first, it looked simple and fabulous. And I shared it with uh, Rafi, our VIN attorney, and he pointed out all kinds of things that I hadn't even noticed. And so we're going to shine the light on that aspect of, um, of transitions as well. What, what do we need in our contract to keep us safe? What do we need in our contract? If we want to continue working, um, this particular contract had no uh, level of protection for me. So I, it, we'll talk about all of that, all the things that I didn't even, I assume everybody's going to be a straight deal. <laughs> um, and you know, so we're gonna we're going to be able to kind of uh, highlight some of those aspects of things that we need to pay attention to, and what and figure out what kind of resources we need to bring uh, to affect the transition that we want, um, and to make sure we're safe and protected. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll go ahead and say it too that there's a lot of traps for the unwary. 
Um, and so, you know, the first few times that I saw these traps, I thought, oh, well, somebody just missed something. Um, and after I saw them dozens and dozens of times, I, I soon came to realize that that some companies will set those traps hoping that uh, veterinarians will stumble into them. So um, we, we have to we have to protect ourselves um, as a profession, you know, internally and, and let everybody know what is going on. Um, and I think the bottom line with the Venn Foundation is, is, you know, no veterinarian is out there on an island by their by themselves. There's there's lots of resources and lots of help. Um, you know, you're not you're not the first one going through this um, and you're certainly not the last as well. Another aspect that I am looking forward to covering as we go through the series will be what about a, a, an associate who's wanting to buy into a practice? Um, uh, you know, what how what kind of tools can we bring to bear to help them make a good decision and make a good contract? And, and what are the ways that folks can step into practice ownership, either partially and then expanding that over time? Um, I think, Lance, you're going to be able to bring some of that information for uh, for our younger associates. What kind of training do they need so they can take the reins of a practice? Um, you know, I bought my practice in 2003 and I had zero training on how to run a practice. Um, uh, and I know we can do a better job for folks than I did for myself. Absolutely. So that is really one of my passions. I have the opportunity to speak to a lot of veterinary schools and, and teach things like business and contract law and negotiations and, and a number of veterinary schools. Um, and so I, I, I do always ask and, and practice ownership is, is a passion of mine. Um, it was a, it was a passion of mine during veterinary school and out of veterinary school and now as a national co-advisor for the VBMA, the Veterinary Business Management Association. You know, I want to instill that that want and that love of practice ownership, you know, for that next generation of veterinarians. Um, and I will say, Brie, I've got some good news that when I ask a class of veterinary students, and this is the whole class, not just the VBMA chapter, the whole class at some schools, at, at a lot of schools, I'll get 35 to 40 percent of the hands go up to say I'm interested in practice ownership at some point in time. Now, down the road, uh, somewhere that interest falls off. So, you know, I think we need to explore why are, are veterinarians losing that interest once they become veterinarians and out into practice to become practice owners. Uh, but then also, what tools can we give them to to think about buying that practice, to make that decision to buy that practice? And and just like your experience, my experience, you know, delving into practice ownership was exactly the same. Although I tried to get the training, I um, mean, it was it was very much a uh, um, a, a trial by fire uh, situation where, you know, you do really have to learn on the fly on how to be a practice owner. So I think there's a lot of things that we can give uh, to practice to, to associates thinking about it and also their employers on, hey, how, how can we, we spur them on to think about buying a practice? Um, and two things that I'll say to that. One is, is it's really about communication. I can't, one of the most disappointing conversations that I'll have, Bree, is I'll talk to a practice owner and they'll say, none of my associates want to buy a practice. They just, they just, they just don't want to. I'll talk to the associates and they'll say, they just don't want to sell. They'll uh, never sell to the associates. They want, they want to sell yeah. somewhere else. And it's extremely yeah. painful where, you know, I know that we just have a, a pure breakdown in communication yeah. where the want is there. But the, the the lines of communication are not open. Um, so, you know, big, big, big issue um, on that. And then secondly, when it comes to, you know, to practice, you know, ownership associates stepping into practice ownership, all I can say is, is it it is hard. There's some days that aren't fun, but it is very rare that I run across a practice owner that is that is disappointed in their decision to become a practice owner. It works out well for almost everyone in the yeah, end. Yeah, I think practice ownership is a huge, it's been a huge plus in my life. It's uh, it's allowed me to practice the way I like to practice. You know, one of the, my pet peeves when I was buying my practice was that I, I could never have an ultrasound. And now I'm on my second one. <laughs> you know, it's just, you get to buy the toys you want <laughs> and you've got get to uh, do the CE that you want. You get to really drive your practice in the direction that you want to drive it in. You can really make a great place for your team as well. Um, and, and another thing about private practice ownership, the wealth is in the ownership. 
That's really how uh, that's really how we become financially stable. Right now, with corporations owning practices, all the money is going to the corporation and not to the associates. And really, um, that's I think that needs to be we need to hold that as part of our future for our profession. I think it's super important that we empower our colleagues to own their own practices and to share that ownership and to share the wealth in that way, so that we keep the that we keep the power with the doctor. That is correct. The, you know, there, there are great financial rewards for becoming a practice owner. Um, and so, you know, a lot of Venn, Re- Venn Foundation resources are directed towards student debt. Um, and I can't, fi- I can't think of a better way to eliminate that student debt by achieving the practice, practice ownership and the financial rewards that, that come with it. So it really, it really goes hand in hand. Yeah, I think so. I feel like those are the goals for this series. We want to talk about uh, all the different ways of transitioning our practice uh, ownership. We want to talk about all the ways of bringing uh, new associates into the ownership pool. We're going to empower each other to really be the architects of our future. I think one of the things yes. that I, I appreciate both of you guys saying here is that, you know, everything that we do with the foundation, we want it to be really tangible and really, really helpful. So the goal is, is that with these conversations, it continues and kicks off further conversations amongst colleagues and that you know this this episode really being a kickoff to let you guys know what's coming next but also just we will provide some helpful information and links in the episode notes to start getting you thinking um and we're also looking at ways that we can make this as i said in the beginning more interactive but you we have a great resource here in in lance and another one in brie because we kind of are able to get both sides of this and one thing that you touched on lance which i think is so vitally important is there are practice owners who don't think the associates want to purchase and associates who don't think the practice owners want to sell. And and that lack of communication is probably happening, I'm sure happening in so many different areas of the profession. And if we're able to, you know, help those conversations happen and just put in the idea of opportunity into both those um, types of potential buyers and sellers, I think that that alone is, is is really helpful and a great place to start. Well, Jordan, thanks for putting this together for us. I think this is going to be really helpful to so many of our colleagues. And I totally know it's going to be helpful to me. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one question to both of you is, you know, we're kind of giving, I mean, this episode is turning into a bit of like a little teaser. So how can we, how can we give them something or what could be helpful right now if they are kind of chomping at the bit to learn more? Lance, what would you suggest? We can put in the episode notes some suggestions of resources that you might have. Um, we know there's been conversations on the VIN boards. Um, obviously, everything with the VIN Foundation is free. You don't have to be a VIN member. Um, and so we will put info about this as well up on the Foundation blog posts um, and have other areas that you can go. But Lance, are there any things that you would just suggest to our audience right now if they kind of want to just get like ahead of the game? I So my first, uh, you know, my first step would be to really take a step back and ask why, why is it that you're wanting to sell your practice? Um, and, and, I'll, and the second thing that I'll say to that is, is sometimes you can be so far in the weeds, so far behind with your caseload and your workload, so swamped with everything that's going on financially, um, that it's hard to really even hear your own thoughts. And so, you know, my, if I had to assign some homework mm-hmm. to the listeners mm-hmm. that have, have made that decision to sell their practice is to go find their quiet space, take four to six hours, um, you know, if it, if it means, you know, go get a vacation rental, uh, go take a mini vacation, mm-hmm. uh, go, go find that spot that you can really dive into your thoughts and really get a piece of pe- a pen and a piece of paper out and write down what it is that's going on that, that makes you want to sell. Mm-hmm. Um, and really from there, once we understand that, then we can understand, you know, what the best next steps are. Um, but you know, I, I can tell you, I've been there well, where your brain and your in the busy practice life and the busy practice ownership, uh, becomes so foggy, um, that you make a decision that is, is not the best in the long run right. because you're just more or less rushed into that decision. Mm-hmm. So this is one of those decisions where we really want to pump the brakes and, uh, and really, and really decide the why, 
Um, but then also too, it's not just, you're not, we're not making a binary decision here as to why to sell or why are, you know, to sell or to not to sell. If you, it's perfectly okay if you do decide to sell, but understanding the why really helps us drive the best deal down the road. And so whether that means you staying on the practice and working or, Hey, we need to relieve you of the, of the finances and the business activities. Um, or is it, you know, is it, uh, finding employee, you know, finding good associates, finding good staff members, if those, if, if those are the particular reasons why, um, then we need to, you know, more or less create an antidote for that, you know, during the transition process when we're negotiating the deal. Yeah, I really like that. I think taking the time to understand our why probably personally in life, <laughs> let alone professionally, is really, really important. So I, I love that that's, that's the quote unquote homework that you're giving them, Lance, because I think that's a great place to start, right? Because it's so easy to get so focused on just, as you said, the busy day to day of practice and just go, 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 and really stopping and thinking, wait, why do I want to do this? And what is what's my purpose with this? And then helping them identify the best approach from that is so, so important. So I really like that. And I, I mean, I think we, we definitely need to ask Bree, like, Bree, do you know your why? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I think for you, Bree, it's probably shifted over the last, you know, year plus. And yeah. You probably started it with one why and it's probably shifted. I have to that. say, you know, my poor husband, uh, every time I go on vacation or we have an extra little minute together, he asks me what I want to do with the practice. And it's different every time the poor man, his head's probably exploding because <laughs> um, I'll be like, I'm doing this and I'm committed to this and this is how I'm going. And then uh, after I sit with that for a minute, I'm like, nope, that's not good. I don't like that. I'm just completely going the other direction. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's just how it is to be married to me, too. So just get used to it. Um, but I, I will say that I think it's really helpful to know your why. I think it's also helpful to um, just open up the possibility that you could have your life look the way you want it to look. And take a minute and say, what do I want it to look like? You know, because because. Three years ago, I would have said I'm going to practice full time until I'm a thousand years old because I love practice. Um, and, and then in the last year, things have changed. So we need to really be willing to blue sky our life, blue sky our plans and say, right, what do right. I want my life to look like? And open yourself up to the opportunity. To the possibility that you could have everything you want. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or many things you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. And that's the beauty of practice ownership because you're in the driver's yeah, seat, right? Um, and you you can intentionally make those decisions and and uh, and and drive what the rest of your life. Yeah, would look and the like. cool thing is that asking questions and learning more it doesn't need to be scary. I mean, uh, it's going to be okay. We're going to figure things out. We're going to make good decisions. And if we're not liking the way the decisions feeling, we can change our minds. Right, and nobody's alone in this. As you know, Lance said earlier, which I really appreciated. You know. You're, nobody is any anyone that's out there listening. You're not the only one that's felt this before. I assure you, others have felt this, and and we're gonna kind of take Bree's gonna be our guinea pig that we're taking through this experience. So <laughs> to her homework <laughs> now is to, is to sit down and have some quiet time oh, and think I can't about sit her still why. For four hours. I cannot sit still for four hours. Oh my god. <laughs> I can't sit still for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. maybe what you do is you take the Huskies on a walk and then that can be the time that you need to just think and, you know, it, yes. maybe it could start there. I don't know. It's Lance is the teacher, so yeah. he gets to approve it or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only, only teacher because I've, I've been there before. And yeah. so I, I very much remember several times, you know, on, on what it's like to, you know, to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll go ahead and say it too, that this podcast is not just for those that are thinking about retirement. Right. Um, there's plenty of, of practice owners like myself that are, you know, mid-career um, and then have sold practices and, and done different things with practices as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is going to yeah, be like I'm, a workshop. I'm, I'm super excited. excited. 
<laughs> it's Free's workshop. Yes. We're all just it's my, it. it's, well. It's Free's world. We just don't live in it. So <laughs> my poor family. <laughs> well, we're very grateful for everything that you do, Bree, for our colleagues. And is there anything else that either of you think you want to leave the audience with now? And then, um, you know, obviously we'll have a lot more episodes, a lot more information. But any anything else either of you think we should leave with the audience? I'll just say, stay tuned. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> well, I'd love to, I'd love to hear the feedback and, and really, you know, let, let audience members, you know, drive food, future projects. Right, and right. so, you know, please send us a comment mm-hmm. or an email or a message that says, Hey, I'd really like to talk about this, that, or yeah. the other. Uh, so we can yeah, talk about it. We don't yeah. know what we don't know. We don't know what you need. So, um, yep. you know, we're a community. We're here for each other. We're here for you. Um, Give us some input. Uh, let us know what what's your burning question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both, Bree and Lance, for your time and your effort. And we're really excited about this series. I think it's going to be great. And check the episode notes to find ways to reach out um, or provide feedback. We are always here and we're here for you. Thanks, Bree and Lance. We really appreciate it. Thank you for letting yeah, me take part. I'm, Looking forward I'm, to it. I'm so happy you guys are helping doing this. This is great. yay (laughs) hope everyone has the best day possible and we'll chat with you soon thank you thank you thank you for joining us for this episode of the veterinary pulse please check the episode notes for additional information referenced in the podcast if you enjoyed this podcast please follow subscribe and share review we welcome feedback and hope you will tune in again You can find out more about the VIN Foundation through our website, vinfoundation.org, and our social media channels. Thank you for being here. Be well.